Well, I mean, nobody knows who Bruce Bibby is, so welcome to my conundrum. Do do whatever the fuck you want. Well, that was a different kind of cold open for you. We're always <laughs> surprising you. <laughs> Hi, kids. Welcome back to another episode of You Might Know Her From. With Anne and Damien. This is, in fact, a continual, very special episode of You Might Know Her From. As I'm sure you're all well aware at this point, there have been strikes ongoing. Good news is, great news is, that the WGA strike has ended. The AMPTP came back to the table. And the things that the WGA won are huge. And I think that many people are very happy with where they got with AI in terms of the writer's room minimums. So I feel really happy that our WGA friends are able to be back at work. Of course, SAG-AFTRA is still on strike. So if you have any question marks about why SAG is striking, please go back and listen to our episode with President of the LA Local, Jody Long, also former guest of You Might Know Her From, who we love, who breaks down all the details of the SAG after strike and why the actors are still striking. So we remain in solidarity with them. And therefore, we don't have a new actress interview for you today. As you know, this show is usually me and Damien, best friends, queer idiots, shooting the shit with each other about our comings and goings and interviewing an actress each episode. So until the SAG after strike ends we will be coming to you with new content as much as possible. So this continues to be a very special episode of You Might Know Her From. So something we have to talk about immediately is yes your birthday we had another year ah! another year around the sun my little buckwheat duck here has made it if you don't if you know who buckwheat <laughs> is then if you know you know no book buckwheat bushroot remember bushroot Wait, who's no who's bushroot i was like oh buckwheat yeah of no, no 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 google, Go- google google image bushroot bushroot the duck okay. that's that, something about oh, you god. i think i've told you before that you oh, look god. like bushroot oh god you give Bushroot Oh, energy. yeah. No, I think Bushroot is hot. I appreciate that. <laughs> Bushroot is lanky with floppy hair. My hair is kind of doing what yeah, doing You kind of like look a, like Bushroot when I joined the call. Honestly, when I'm looking at Bushroot in like a suit jacket, sort of like a lab coat situation, that might be my new look since I just turned 40. You know, I'm just like trying on new things. I bought a trench coat this week for $15. Very excited to try that London fog on for size. But uh, I'll be looking to Bushroot maybe for hair inspiration for the fall. If you don't know, Bushroot is a character, a villain from the Darkwing Duck universe, and he is male, but sort of a play or a parody on Poison Ivy from Batman, so I was very into him as a kid. Oh, I see the color scheme is purple and green. Yeah, I get it. Okay. And Anne looks like him. So Anne turned 40. I didn't want to reveal the age. I felt like it was your thing to give away, but now that the goose is given, I will tell. So (laughs) Anne turned 40, and we went to Coney (laughs) Island, and we went to the sideshow, which was like the best it was like the best party it was so fun uh, we went to yeah. the side show where the miss little mermaid the miss Mer- coney island mermaid parade winner i pageant miss winner coney island? miss coney island it's <laughs> not that but something like that miss yeah. muffin one she was there and she sang toxic at like a vaudevillian like sort of like vampy version of toxic by britney yeah. spears while also laying her body on a bed of nails and after the show we saw her on the street and she told our big group of friends like you guys are really like at the audience like an audience that we like to have because you were so <laughs> like loud <laughs> and i was so touched by it i thought of it this i don't know i thought of it when we joined yeah. this call there was also the sword swallower named alaska the lost boy and i went to their instagram and they were like yeah, I'm like, they look like Parvati from Survivor, sort of. Very into Alaska, the Lost Boy. It was just a thrill. It, I'd never, I don't believe I had ever been to, I've never been to Coney Island and I had never been to a sideshow. And it felt like such an adventure to go all the way there. And what a day we had. And it was just a great birthday. I'm so glad you were born. I love your parents and I love that they gave birth to you and that they raised you to be who you are and that you continue to be, get better and better every year, my friend. 
Thank you so much. I love you. I'm so glad we were able to do it together. It was perfectly weird and beautiful and strange. And we ended up in Brighton Beach and had one of the best dinners of my entire life at a place called the Hot Potato House, which I highly recommend. Please find Anna, the host server. Oh, my God. Person who she was like the best. It was like the best customer service experience I've ever had in my life. It was an Eastern European restaurant where we just ordered like a shit ton of potatoes in different forms and had horseradish vodka shots. I, I just like it was really great. And I felt like it was exactly what I wanted for my 40th. So thank you for being there. Listeners, thank you for ushering me into my 40th year. I am so grateful that we're still here. I feel like I had a lot of anxiety or anticipation around it, not because I care about the number explicitly, but obviously there was some stuff creeping up that I was surprised by. So I was, you know, teetering on the edge for a little bit for a few days. But then once the day rolled around, it was actually so wonderful. Highly recommend the New York City Ferry. It's now $4, but I still think it's a good deal. It's one of the best deals in town. You get great views and there's booze on board. Coney Island, Brighton Beach. I just love New York City. It's my, I, I'm getting sentimental here, Damien, but like really when I was 18, it, the most important thing to me was to be able to move to New York City. And now I've lived here for over 20 years and it's a very big deal for me. So I love it. I love the city. I love the strange beauty of it. I love all the weirdos that get to inhabit it. And I hope that the billionaires don't continue to take over so that weird people can't make their way here like we both did. So I love you so much and thank you for helping me celebrate. Well, it was my pleasure. And that said, I love New York. Our mutual friend Seth was telling me, I think at your birthday dinner, how he had just had a whole conversation with a friend about how like he could never see himself not living living anywhere else besides <laughs> New York City. And then a woman on the subway pulled her pants down and took like a bloody <laughs> shit next to him. And he was like, cool. And uh, then last night I'm walking Ronnie, the intern of the show. <laughs> and this motherfucker <laughs> tried to eat a baby rat. I told this to someone today and they were like, what does a baby rat look like? And I was like, like a mouse. And they were like, maybe it was a mouse. And I was like, it was a rat. It definitely wasn't. I'm sorry. New York City barely has mice. If it's if it's small, it's still a rat. How big was it? Like, tell me the size. Like, was it one of those ones where you're like, oh, it's like embryonic where it's sort of like doesn't have fur yet? I or does couldn't, it have fur? It had fur, but it was pretty small. It was like the size of yeah. like, you know, a little, maybe like one of those little potatoes that you put in a, yeah, it's holding a oh. perp. You know, like a little potato, <laughs> like when yeah, you buy yeah, like, like a, a little big purple potato. Yeah, like, what, purple, like maybe a, a little, potato. maybe a little bigger than one of them. Okay, all right, that's. But Ronnie got it. She got it. It was in her mouth and it was out, and then it was, <laughs> and then I like, like, I pulled her leash and she dropped it. But then I like dropped my phone, so then I like had loosened the leash, so then she got it again. And meanwhile, it's like. And I was like, ah! And then she got it again, and then I pulled her leash again. I, I never said drop it, which she actually knows, but I didn't yeah. say it because I was in such a state of shock. I felt like a mother yeah. who was lifting a car with their child underneath it, except my child was making me feel fucking insane. So she dropped it, and then it, like, was... I don't need to explain what was happening, but I just, like, ran, and I feel like I texted you on a chain with you your partner and your sister-in-law and then Naomi hi Naomi she FaceTimed me as I was like in the darkness and she was like what's happening and I was like I just feel like I am like my heart is pounding and I can't look at Ronnie for eight hours I like washed Ronnie's face and her teeth and okay that's good thankfully she did not her face was not close to me last night but today right. it has been today you know it's okay I-, I told you this but i do think dogs mouths are cleaner than humans and we've probably both had our mouths in much nastier places mm. she's very good she's very good she's very quick we applaud her instinct and I'm glad that you're keeping her safe. She's trying to keep the streets of New York City safe. Well, speaking of keeping the s- streets safe, we okay. So I let's let's back let's let's rewind. So we talked about the, that we are doing a special version of this show because of yeah. the strike, and I, I'd say that like internally, <laughs> we've been talking about it and describing it as why well, you really look like Bush Root right now. You look like you just take a picture, your- <laughs> screenshot it. I'm not moving. Screenshot it. <laughs> I'm not gonna move. Wait, you look so cool. I got it. I've never looked worse. I've I never got, looked worse. I got it. It looks like I'm you, gonna try to watch some dark wing duck and see if I can like get in the spirit. It would be a good Halloween costume. Thank you. But what I was gonna say is that we have been talking about it just the two of us, like, oh, like this version of us not having a guest or not interviewing actresses is what it would be like if we had a Patreon. And yeah. when the actors resolve their strike, we are committed to launching a Patreon. Is it okay that I'm saying this? Of course it is. Yeah, of course so, it is. So, I feel like this is what we've been working towards because 
we love interviewing actresses. That project, I'm sorry to say here, Damien, is never going to die. If you disown me, if you <laughs> cut me out of your life, we'll still find a way to do the project <laughs> because I feel like it's that important to both of us. So you might know where her from is not going anywhere, but I do think that Damien and I, as we've said many times on the show, our Venn diagram overlap is a quite large. So there's many people and things that pique both of our interests. And that's the pool we had to tap into once we started trying to figure out what we're going to do because we keep Keep, we want to keep being in your ears during this time. And obviously, we're fully in support of the union, but we want to be here with you. So we were trying to figure out what are we excited about? Who else would we want to talk to? Well, and also we're talking about keeping this street safe. And I feel like we were like, oh, yeah. should we book club a Halloween film? And then we were like, well, Halloween adjacent film would be Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the original film, not the TV show, which is not canon for either... Damien or myself but the film is and I haven't watched it in maybe like 20 years and it was formative for me and it came back into the front of my mind recently when Paul Rubens may he rest passed away and I think that his performance is one of the most underrated things in all of oh, like I am so excited 90s I don't even cinema. remember all I can remember I know Luke Perry's in it obviously Christy Swanson and I remember that Hillary Swank plays one of the popular girls one day yeah. maybe I'll have to I find this episode in the canon when Hill says yes and have to delete this but I think it is terrible casting and I cannot wait to, <laughs> and I can't wait to rewatch it to agree with myself I can't wait to agree with myself from when I was nine um <laughs> <laughs> also, you know what I just thought? I was like, oh, we should watch it together because like we should do something, you know, in the spooky season together. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, maybe we just like take like maybe we just like have a bottle of wine and have our mics and we just record while we're watching. And I was like, well, maybe that's something we save for the Patreon. But that might be fun, right? If we just yeah. talk during the movie and you just have to yes. listen to us watch it along. You might be into it. You might not be. You let us know. Okay, folks, so we will be movie clubbing the 1992 film Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is now streaming on HBO Max and a few other places, I think, available for purchase. If you have any issue with it, let me know. We'll see what we can do about making sure that you can watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer before our episode drops in two weeks. Please join us back here after that, because I do feel like it's really going to scratch a certain itch for some of you. It is not Halloween-y, but it is, for me, Halloween adjacent, because... They're vampires. Just real quick, can we talk about like five movies, if you have it? I think I can. I'm not sure I have five, but I think I do. Five movies that are like to you, like Halloween or Halloween adjacent mm. that that aren't necessarily. I'll, I'll go first. Buffy okay. the Vampire Slayer. Edward yeah. Scissorhands. Beetlejuice. Yeah, well, I was going to put Beetle, yeah, Beetlejuice is on my list. Beetlejuice is the biggest one. I mean, I watch other movies that are like, I think that they're Halloween-y movies. Like, which movies? Like, Practical Magic, is it a Halloween movie? To me, it is. I, think it, I mean, I think it definitely is. Is Teen Witch a oh. Halloween movie? To me, it is. A thousand percent. Is The Craft a Halloween movie? To me, it is. Yes. I mean, I think it is because we started watching them during Witch Fest. But all of those things, if they have a spooky vibe at all, I think the thing that differentiates the kind of Halloween movies that we're interested in is because all of those movies have good soundtracks. And I think that is part of it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Join us back. We will be touching on Christy Swanson, who was important to me as a young queer person, but is really difficult as an adult queer person. Tell you know the what audience I mean? so, what was attractive about her. I like this specific about you because you're not usually into blondes, but you have a, you qualify it with... It is that I love a platinum bleach blonde with brown roots and brown eyebrows. Like to me, that is like, it's very Emily Valentine. I was literally, oh my yeah. God. It's, I was like, be like, is it, does, is, does Christina least count? You know, the euphoria yes. of I think her. she was maybe, she may have been the root. You know what I mean? <laughs> I still love that look. I remember when Portia de Rossi shows up in Scream 2 with it. I was like, hey, yay, yay. I didn't think I liked you, but now maybe I, I don't know. It's still a thing. I Portia still like de Rossi a, a platinum in Scream blonde. 2 is a jump scare because the eyebrows are so yeah. severe the eyebrows are terrifying yeah so i'm really i'm really excited to revisit buffy i do i did love christy swanson as a young person but she is awful she's truly awful you know what else is awful the awful truth folks we're so hey. excited to have with us this week 
someone we really looked up to when we were young queer people who were just obsessed with pop culture and also just like desperately trying to find ourselves and other queer identity and also for me at least like feeling like it was okay to be queer in media and in pop culture and we get into all of this so I won't belabor the point but we're very excited for you to hear this interview I would love to give the caveat that this was recorded before Drew Barrymore's scab behavior. I know that Drew Barrymore is or was America's sweetheart, and I have no doubt that she will worm her way back in because of her fucking legacy name, but uh, I do not condone her scab behavior, and I know Anne does not either, but we couldn't remove the stuff in, and you'll understand why, because it involves bisexuality. So with that said, please enjoy this episode with Ted Casablanca, also known as Bruce Bibby. You good? I can't tell you how good we are. <laughs> <laughs> this is like maybe decades in the making for Damien and I because we would love to welcome to the show artist, writer, and former gossip columnist Bruce Bibby, aka Ted Casablanca. Bruce, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. It's so nice to be here. I'm honored. You two are pretty funny. You are too generous. Actually, very funny. Very funny. Thank you. <laughs> we will take we will take that compliment. Thank you so much. This is like a big day for us because you're the first non-actress guest that we've ever interviewed together, but you do represent something that we talk a lot about on our show, and that is gay history and gay culture. In the 90s and the early aughts, you were like this smart, funny, out man on TV talking about the ins and outs of Hollywood, and you were really a gay North Star for both Damien and I. <laughs> like This was something that <laughs> we discovered you. very early on in our friendship, it started back in 2010, where we discovered that we both we're obsessed with your work. Before we were recording, we were talking about this a little bit, but for our listeners, so Ted Casablanca is a pseudonym. Your name is Bruce Bibby. And yes, to offer context right. for our listeners who may not know, Ted Casablanca is the gay fashion designer in Valley of the Dolls, the film Valley <laughs> of the Dolls, who, when I believe Patty Duke is like smoking a cigarette and like bemoaning something he said, Ugh, Sharon Tate God. responds like, not to worry about him because you know b- how bitchy fags can be. So Anne and I were like laughing about this, like how iconic that this is the sort of the name that you took on and like owning this. We know that you interviewed one of the stars of Valley of the Dolls, Barbara Parkins at the Castro years ago. Did you ever? Yeah, she's a, a good friend of she's mine. She's a friend. Uh, we're still in touch. Yeah. I love this. I love that. Did you ever sit down with Patty Duke? No, I never met her. And I would like to have. I heard she was kind of like Barbara, not afraid of what she had done. Uh, I mean, you certainly wouldn't hear the same from Faye Dunaway about <laughs> Mommy Dearest. Right. I think she, the camp aspect of dolls and um, the over the topness didn't scare Barbara. And I hear it didn't scare Patty after a few years. Maybe you all can speak to, I've heard that eh, it was challenging what the movie did to her career. I don't know personally how she felt about it. Do you all know? <laughs> I was like really obsessed with her because I read her autobiography, Call Me Anna. And I was a very... What did she say? She, I, My memory of it is that as you said, she was. it took her time to get used to right. the legacy of this movie and also the Judy Garland of it all and then her being removed from the film and also being in, able to sort of invest in it at a certain point and realizing that gay people were obsessed with it and with her and had so much love and wanted to sort of... And straight people. Yeah, right, right. Surprisingly so, yeah. Yeah. And I think people wanted to like take care of Patty Duke in some ways, or I mean, I think her fan base did the way that some of them wanted to like take care of Judy Garland, that she garnered a little bit of that same love from the Neely O'Hara of it all. Excellent point. I think the fans admire and still admire Barbara very much, but I don't think they feel as sympathetic as they did to Patty. Yes. Barbara's a, we're probably, the reason we're friends is um, she's a little chilly. I'm a little chilly. <laughs> And Patty, in my impression, was that she was a little more real, a little bit more earthy. Oh, interesting. Yeah, she was like an open book and sort of had to wear her mental health challenges on her sleeve a little bit later on in her career. But I was very into like, she did Gypsy like in Oregon or something years, years ago. No way. Yeah. Really? she, She did Aunt Eller in Oklahoma. Was she a replacement Aunt Eller? I just was very into the course that her career took. She seemed wonderful. She also was a child actor, so she got that goodwill of like being a, you know, like people had love for her already. Right. 
isn't that interesting the child act that that could be a whole show yeah. i feel like nobody did it better than jody foster and there are many like i feel like patty duke who you know lindsay lohan who had a few bumps before they could make the transition yeah. and i can't can you all think of anybody else who made it as seamlessly as Jody Foster. The person that comes to mind for me is Drew Barrymore. Ron Howard, Drew maybe. Drew Barrymore, oh, she, but she did, but she had some bumps along the way as well. Like, oh, she had some bumps <laughs> and she owns them. Uh, yeah. Yes, which I love. I love her bisexual years and her, you know, like wild child years. But her bisexual. But, but they years. were not the same. Uh, but yes, she did not like. I feel like Jodie Foster was sort of seamlessly, you know, like a child actor and then an actor in like prestige film. But I think you're you think right. Ron, Ron Howard seems so well adjusted, and you're like, how did this I, happen? Yeah. How is that possible? I don't smell any bisexual years on Ron Howard. Right, unfortunately you? for all of us. <laughs> okay, well, so let's for let's offer for our listeners. Let's offer some context. I need to let you run this interview. I am sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I, we, I have to I tell you, that I should do it for a living, and it's I'm going to stop. I'll behave. No, bless you. We well, love it you, because well, how can I help? We you? always sort of clock when we interview someone. We'll, we'll maybe be able to edit this out, but when we interview an actress and she like doesn't ask us any questions or name us at all, and like we of course we always know the people who are like Anne. Dave Damien, or like, where, like, how did you guys meet? Like, things like that. It's, we always know that and notice it and appreciate it. So thank you for engaging with oh, us. As, I hope you don't edit that out. I think that's Well, I don't a, want actresses a, to listen and think that we, we talk about them bad, you know? <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> we want them to, yeah, we want their yeah. managers to listen and want them to be on the show and not think we go back and say things about them. Okay, here I am and going again. I have to slap myself. I want to ask about your pronouns. I mean, what about the name of the blog? Because you both, you, well, actually, Damien, you're. I'm a he, him. He, right. And I'm, and I use she, her. She, her. Yeah. But I noticed you use actress as opposed to actor. And I'm curious about that. Tell me. What are your feelings on that? Bruce, you are really just hitting the nail on the head for us. I feel like it's really been a real conversation for us from the beginning because we never used the word actress when we talked about women actors. We always used actor as a non-gendered term. Sometimes we said women actresses or, right. you know, and we veered in that territory. Depending on the space or the interviewee, I think it shifts sometimes, but we have been leaning more towards actress Lately, because I think when we first started the project, we were focused on making sure that the statement of the show was that we were interviewing women and non-binary, non-cis performers. And that was very that was a very clear mission statement for us. And I think as we've moved through the project, it's felt important to specify woman mm -hmm. and and less grouping um, non-binary people in with women if that that seemed reductive. Mm -hmm. So I think actress has sort of come out of the space of trying to keep it not restrictive, but to sort of make sure that we are keeping the project specific as opposed to saying that we're grouping non-binary and gender non-conforming people in with women, even if they were assigned female at birth, that seems sort of uh, I think it was like our own blind spots there. That was very well said, Anne. But I think that was our own thinking of like, oh, well, like this is you are tangentially connected to women actor. And then it was like, well, actually not at all. So like this project is really about we really want to center women actors, especially people who don't get to do a lot of press or who don't get interviewed a lot and want, wanting to highlight them and their stories. What do you think about the Oscars <laughs> you using actor and actress? I think I feel I feel I'm not sure about it. I think that there is an argument to be made for removing gender from the categories. But again, based on the history of the Academy and all awards, it would veer so hard in the cis male direction, I think, that would, in and of itself would be unfair. But I also... How about removing the Oscars, period? <laughs> I would love it. I would add, yeah. I'm so over them at this point. I used to I, love them and I don't care anymore. Same. And I don't know if this is one of those things where the older you get, you just see things you have perspective, you have lived a life, and so you see things differently. But I really held them to such a standard. And then over the years, and I do maybe blame Harvey Weinstein for this, which is like the like the four-year consideration ads, like the ways in which it all became a 
campaign for your award sort of thing opposed right. to anything. And I know yeah. that that's just, that is the industry, I suppose. But I feel like looking back on like the heydays I of the Oscars when I have such affection for them and now it's like, oh, such so-and-so has been like a th- two-time Oscar nominations in one year. Like sh- they're not even good, but okay. Like I guess so. Damien. <laughs> I mean, you don't have a problem with Gwyneth Paltrow getting an Oscar for Shakespeare in Love, do you? Come on. It's more about really? it's more about Scarlett Johansson having two Oscar nominations in one year, which is just like shocking to me. But you know why? She's a she's a she's a great actor. I mean, just because she's not a nice person doesn't mean she's not a great actor. <laughs> Should people who aren't nice not get actors? That's kind of. I kind of debate into people not being nice, but being good, (laughs) you know? Tell me what you think Scarlett should not have been nominated for. Uh, I thought Wedding Story was awful. I thought that movie was awful. Which one? Is that what it called? Wedding Story? Marriage Story? A Marriage Story. Marriage Story. Thank you. Yeah, that was... Oh, I thought it was... I I thought it was great. I thought she was... I thought she was... (laughs) A bit like herself, but, (laughs) you know, people say that. They think, oh, they're just playing themselves... You know, that's bullshit. It takes a lot of talent, I think, and knowing yourself to play yourself. Cher is a great actor. Not everyone can do it. Cher is a great actor. George, well, Cher is a great actor, and that is- Why didn't Cher pursue that more? Do you think it was too much work? Mm. She's so talented. I think she probably made so much money off residencies and tours that it was not worth taking time off from doing those to do- movies which like probably required months away and she was like i can just yeah. be on the road and make like bruce double. did you see mama mia too yeah I, I, no i couldn't i i i almost walked out of the first one like, there's no way in the world i would ever see anything after that and i love abba okay, okay. but that was like it was too much i think that was the beginning <laughs> of when okay Meryl Streep is starting to take other women's roles that, you know, it should have gone to. She's so talented. She's a good singer. But, you know, when they had the the the, the, the overshot, overshot of her, of her, on the of her crow's yeah. feet, I just thought, I just, I, you know, I can't get into this. She's not. This is not ABBA. You know, ABBA is kind of like youthful <laughs> and kind of kid stuff. And she's like grandma, you know, playing the lead. And what? Who you, who do you all think should have done it? Or did you like Streep in it? I loved that she did it because it felt so stupid. I feel like it only got me because she was like, let's go party in Greece for three months. Everybody was like, we're going to be drunk the whole time on a boat. Yeah. And she got them yeah. all to sign off. And it felt like yeah. they got away with something yeah. that it got made. So from my perspective, yes. I'm like, yes. okay, and, and now it's a global phenomenon. It's kind of incredible. But I agree with you. If we're going for realism, absolutely not. But I feel like if you buy into the stupidity of the it. fantasy. Totally. Yeah. But everyone else was cast... I felt yes. well. Actually, the guys were kind of duds too. So I guess <laughs> yeah, I, I liked, loved how I bad liked Pierce Brosnan was singing. You know, yeah. I loved it. I was like, I cannot believe this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> I guess no. Well, you, I, 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 I don't know. I'm gonna go back to Dawn Steele. Do you know who she was? No, I don't think so. She was okay. Now we're back in class. Dawn Steele was the first. Or if not the first, one of the first women heads of production at Columbia. Okay. And when they were casting Footloose, she said, Kevin Bacon, no way, he's not fuckable. And I kind of feel like I wanted, like with Pierce, who used to be hot, and Meryl, who used to be hot, I kind of wanted more of a fuckable crowd. <laughs> And instead of just leaving it to the kids, because I find older men and women very, very sexy. But I, it just, maybe it was that it was supposed to be a bit of a joke. I don't know. I, I should see it again. Put it on please, your list. If you watch it, please just send us a voice recording of your, your rewatch <laughs> review, because we need to know if, if you had any new ideas. Okay. I am interested in the conversation about... Meryl Streep not accepting every role. Like, I think about this a lot with August Osage County and how, like, the character is supposed to be very sick and, like, she's supposed to be, like, a firecracker, but, like, a slight woman, a small-framed woman who's, like, she's terminally ill and she's, like, mean. And I was like, Meryl Streep is not good in this. And, like, why wasn't this, like, Susan Sarandon? You know, like, why? like Good. Like Susan Sarandon would have been good. Yeah. Like, I think about, like, Susan Sarandon and 
Holly Hunter. And Holly Hunter. And, and like also just like Sigourney Weaver and Glenn Holly Close. Hunter and all, would have been good. All of the other women of that era who should be working a little bit more maybe because Meryl yeah. accepts all the roles. I think you're spot on about this. And now that I, you know, I, she wasn't likable. She wasn't good. And I think it's because a character like that who still holds, you know, power over her family, over her domain, you should have seen something likable that would have created that power from the beginning. And she's hateful. Yes. You don't see anything that ever would have been kind of like people. I mean, if she had been that way from the beginning, her family wouldn't have been there in the room. Right. I think. So, yeah, Hunter, who could probably play steely and mean, but kind of with a little that little lilt mm -hmm, of literally, a southern yes, yes, yes. likeness in the background yeah who do you think is like an actress over 60 that is not getting enough roles i mean there's hundreds of them but who is on your short list oh god an actress over 60 i've always been a fan of sharon stone i think she got fucked yes uh, yes decades ago um, by the system, boy, you, you know, you could do a whole podcast on that. Fucked by the system. Yeah. I can't even believe Sharon Stone is in her 60s now. Is that right? She's so good. Oh, she's got to be. She's so Wait, good Bruce, you had the, the, there's this quote that you have about how like one of your favorite Hollywood isms is that Sharon Stone like missed her horse from the quick and the dead. And so she had it FedEx to uh -huh. her next like movie location. Is that, does that still? Well, wait, wait, that's, you know, I, I called the set. They wouldn't confirm or deny, but <laughs> that's. <the> <laughs> <laughs> This is the kind of reporting that like bridged <laughs> Damien and I's friendship. This is beautiful. But this goes back to, you know, yes, Sharon Stone is not likable. She's a chilly woman, like way more than I am, way more than my mother. And that's saying something. But I, I think it's important to make a point that like you don't have to be likable to be good at your job. Yes. Lots of assholes are successful most <laughs> assholes are successful in hollywood but somehow in front of the camera audiences and producers feel like oh you're supposed to get to some likability which does make sense on a money spectrum but people don't forget in hollywood and they don't hire people they find uh not to their liking mm -hmm. it can be a very petty tone I know you're not in the business of gossip anymore, but going back to August Osage County for a minute, I just remembered that Meryl Streep and Julia Roberts apparently hated each other on that set. Do you remember that story, Anne? Yes. You know, lot, lots of people hated each other. You know, Fonda and and Lopez on... Um, <gasps> That's uh, what, what Monst Monster-in-Law? Monster-in-Law. Oh, and I actually right. asked Fonda about that. And she gave me one of those good ones that, you know, instead of saying no comment, she just said, you know, I have absolutely. Oh, I asked her who was tougher, Ted Turner or uh, J-Lo. And she <laughs> said she had no way. Because, you know, Turner was a, a horrible husband yeah. and treating her horrifically. <laughs> and some pretty reliable gossip that I <laughs> received from good sources. I mean, I didn't go to, I wouldn't go to the star themselves asking questions if it wasn't a good source yeah it says i'm not an idiot Can and she deflected which of course in my estimation means it was true yeah and she's very good at that she's great at, at she's great at yeah. it more people should be as good at it I'll i mean like unlike jamie fox this is you know i have to tell you too i don't want to be back in the business but it is a shame when I see things that should be reported deftly and no one does. Like, what the fuck is this? Oh, I'm going to thank my fans for wishing me for well, but I'm going to keep you in the dark on what's going on with me. It's insulting to their intelligence. It's like at least give some sort of generic explanation. Otherwise, don't make a statement. Mm, mm. I think you can't have it both ways and they always want to. I think it's an interesting conversation because I think that so much of this is like it's like the Kardashians, it's like social media, Taylor Swift, that people want to 
be like real with their fan base, and, mm-hmm. but they want to craft yeah. the narrative. And so, and then when they do interviews with people, like with a magazine, and then they're like, quote, their quotes are taken out of context for headlines. And they're like, well, I didn't mean it like that. Or like, this was like, this is yeah. like, sabotage me. Yeah. It's like, we've lost the plot a little bit. And so I'm happy with people to have like this gateway to in order for them to be in touch with their fans that's how we got in touch with you that said like it, it there is something to be said for like who is reporting anymore you know like who are doing stories and features and like why like none of that is happening because people would rather like delete all their instagram photos and then like post a video addressing something and like not really telling you anything but it's like they give yeah. you a kernel of something and you're like and people run with it kernel <laughs> A crumb. That's a great word. So you will fill me in. I don't read gossip. I haven't kept up with it in the past decade. I loved it. I enjoyed it. But, you know, that was another life. Is there someone between TMZ, which is an organization I've always highly respected, because, you know, paying for information is, like, so old. It's, like, it's been around forever, and at least they are kind of honest about it, and they're mm-hmm. not dressing it up as some sort of editorial mission to have both sides of the story. They pay for shit, and they put it out. So what? And then you have the other spectrum. Oh, I don't even know what the the best shows are. It's probably something with that guy who's so good looking Mario Lopez. and yes and that smile that just won't ever stop and <laughs> the dimples do it the, yeah between Mario Lopez and his beautiful teeth and hair and TMZ yeah who's doing it these days anybody good with with teeth with a <laughs> uh, with a good uh, opinion hi who doesn't get bought or as also something Damien and I were talking about, a reason I left the business was there's so I found so many fellow reporters dying to be the stars they were writing about, which was never my thing, never interested in that. And I found that just pitiful. So is there a good reporter who's got great teeth these days and somewhere in between the spectrum? We were talking about this because this Instagram account sort of went viral during the pandemic, right? Was that when it was? And it's called Dumois. And it was somebody that was just culling tips of, you know, it was really like reality stars, some celebs. It was mostly them like, this person's at dinner. This person is leaving this show. And they went viral for about a week. And then, Damien, what happened? They got like bought and... I don't even know like what the business model is at Dumois, but it's like it's like old school gawker stalker and that like followers send tips like I saw Cindy Crawford's daughter at the West Village with Timothy Chalamet and then it, different things like that but like it's not that's it? it's not anyone that's all they it's do? not anyone no. reporting it it's not, and they are anonymous so they therefore they are doing sort of blind items or they're doing just like little tips like oh, that. th- that's not at all what I'm talking about no there's I, nobody I'm, there's nobody that's filler as far as I'm concerned I'm talking about someone who takes a stand puts their name out no. and writes about something controversial no. is anybody doing I don't that? thing is no. so i feel like like michael musto still writs but he's not writing the way that he was writing back in the day you know like i don't know that you know perez hilton i don't even know what his where he is and what his existence is now but i don't think there's anybody who sort of has taken that spot there's not a new cindy adams in new york city interesting in my do opinion right watching, i mean there's p- page six do people listening to this podcast know who cindy adams our god i name? hope so we've tried to curate our listeners so that they know <laughs> who that is I mean, this is what we grew up on. I had drinks with her once at the Carlisle, and she said, it was so funny. She said, I love Cindy Adams. I I hate what she writes, but I just love her. And she was saying something about, oh, I came into the Carlisle, I think, without a tie. And I apologize because I saw everyone in, in, in the bar wearing a tie. And she said, oh, that's okay. I'll just tell the maitre d' my brother didn't know whether to wear a tie (laughs) oh my god you should be in la you're saying you're my you could be my grandmother god lover god lover's good i feel like i mean if we want to talk about old gals yeah let's do it i mean liz smith i feel like did it pretty much the best and cindy was like a sideshow a floor show which was highly entertaining and i admire that she kept going as long as she did yeah 
And she didn't seem to be grasping towards the end, which Liz unfortunately did. And, you know, that's a tricky thing to avoid. It's also one reason why I left. It's like, I don't want to be walk, writing about what people are wearing, you know, in my 60s. Right. It wasn't for me. I, I think for us, because we were gay kids and we were like obsessed with the awful truth and the gossip show, all of these talking heads. I think there must have been something that obviously picked both of our little gay brains that you were doing this persona that you had created because you were out. But also a lot of the gossip that you were talking about was about like closeted Hollywood and gay people. Well, the blind items were. Yeah, exactly. On, on your column, they were. But like, did you feel the tension of that when you were living so openly and there were so many people in your periphery that were closeted yeah i did actually and it, it's another reason why i retired uh when i started you know I, I i made a splash it was a lot of fun no one else was doing it i was the first major gossip columnist to go online and several of my friends told me oh you'd be mu much more successful if you didn't write gay mm -hmm which kind of says it all. And then when gay became chic, right. they changed their tune. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I was putting it out there pretty loudly, and I was quite unashamed. And I think it probably, I'm sure I would have had a different career if I had not been so out yeah. at that point. You know, whether I didn't think about it too much because it's who I was, and I'm not going to lie. To me, it was a non-issue. It was a, a, a no-brainer. I'm, I'm not dressing up something to be an act. It's who I am. Right. Can you talk to us about how you, res like, how did you get information? I'm sure for, through a variety of sources, but what did that look like in the mid-90s and in the early 2000s? Was it emails? Was it friends that were at bars or restaurants? Was, did you have a series of reliable sources? Well, keep in mind, I started in 96. Mm -hmm. Actually, I started in 95 at Premier. Right. And then they asked me to go to L.A. And I almost didn't. I wanted to stay in New York where I was living. But anyway, I did. So there, was, there were no, there were very, very few online contacts mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. So all of my reporting was done in person, which is what I prefer. And that's how I made my mark. I love people. I'm not a snob. I'll talk to anybody, yeah. you know, and, and there's so many people in Hollywood who look down on staff mm. or, you know, this was long before stylists were stars in their own right. And I, I loved the, the whole family within show business. And I wasn't just talking to stars. And that was probably what made me the most successful is that I considered all information equal mm. and checked it out equally. Someone's power did not take precedent over my items. Truth did. And also humor and stupid shit like Sharon Stone FedExing a horse. I mean, and, <laughs> and Lara Flynn Boyle bleaching her asshole. You know, that was, you can't make that up. And it was really fun to to write about. Oh, it's so fun. Bruce, I just wanted to check in and see if there was ever one story, anything that you ever sat on or anything that you ever wished that you had sat on with hindsight. Brad kissing Angelina at the bar on top of the standard in LA. Okay, why? Lawyers wouldn't let me do it. Got it. Because there's a lot of legal stuff that um, you have to be aware of. And that's also probably one reason why I was successful. I was never sued. If the lawyer says no way, I mean, if you're writing for a corporation like E, which always had different corporate parents, mm -hmm. I survived all of them until Comcast came in. And it was like, okay, these are wasp shits. I got to get <laughs> out of here. And if the lawyer tells you you can't, and that company's paying you. Yeah. Yeah, I could have gone renegade, but it's the only one where the lawyers said no because he was married. Mm. And I that one that's the only one I feel like shit, 
I had that before anybody. You had the scoop first. Yeah, but that's what happens when you write for corporations. Yeah. And I really admired Perez in the beginning when he had his blog at, uh, and he would write it on his laptop at, I think, the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf on Sunset. Okay. And he was calling these lawyers, you know, like scum and assholes, like Marty Singer, you know, people who are scum and assholes. He represents Tom Cruise. I don't know if he still does. Okay. And Perez was calling these people out because he could. Because he, there was because no, he, was no independ- corporation. he wasn't under, he wasn't owned by a Viacom or an NBC Universal or something. It's all about this. Yeah, it's I all see. about money. And there was nothing to sue him for. Right. If I'm behind a corporation, there's lots of bucks there that they're going to go after. Mm-hmm. And then, unfortunately, Perez went in a different direction that uh, I found rather beyond juvenile. That wasn't, you know, my interest. Apparently, a lot of people are interested in juvenile gossip, but it was never my thing. But that's what something when someone sees and starts, I don't know, rating gossip columnists, you've always got to look at the money. That's interesting. That controls entirely what they're saying. But I have a question in terms of like what you're talking about with the legality and like what I feel like Perez was like made a splash. And then I feel like he then sort of got like ended up sort of the bottom fell out or whatever with him and his site and or him as a Perez wanted to be who he was writing about. Yeah, I guess that's I guess that's that's all. It's very simple. But he was also like outing people. And then that was like met with, I think, legal things. And I'm curious, like what, like how you handled that? Because you had all these blind items that talked about yeah. that, in, that there was implications that maybe there were celebrities. Like what was that conversation like with NBC or E about? And how did you work around that? There's several attorneys at these corporations. And I always had one who I liked very much. His name was Tom. And that's the only person I ever dealt with. And he, every blind item was true. And he's the only one who knows who everyone was and what the source was. It's almost treating it like it was true. I mean, not like it was true. It was almost treating it like I was saying who it was. In other words, you had to be prepared to defend it. I don't think I answered your question. Sorry. What was it? I think I, mine got convoluted as well. But I think I was just asking sort of about the legal implications with talking about people's sexuality if they weren't out. But you were using – you weren't using their real names. So you didn't have to – Right. You, you, that was the built-in protection that you guys had figured out at E around talking about these things. Whereas Perez was like drawing a dick on like Lance Bass's face at like the Abbey or whatever, you know? <laughs> Hence the the juvenile approach. And juvenile can be fun. I mean, it's certainly fun on movies and TV, but it didn't feel fun juvenile. It felt uh, bitchy jealous mm. juvenile. And I, I never wrote from a jealous point of view. And I think it's why people liked it. It's like they're reading a guy who is entertained, amused, horrified by his beat that he's writing about but doesn't want to be a member of the club. Can we have the conversation about like this current wave where I think maybe the tide has turned a little bit about what it is to have a celeb come out on their own terms. We are obviously super titillated by gay gossip and Damien and I still will be like, who's gay? Who's, who's, who's in a marriage that isn't actually a marriage or maybe that is a partnership and that's just part of the deal. Like has your perspective on sort of laying the groundwork for toothy tile for example has any of that changed or do you still feel the same way like but this i'm is not a, writing this but is i'm all not fodder. writing about those people anymore right so i i don't understand the question changed in my my Meaning, private point of view yeah if you were working in the industry today would you feel the same meaning are the laws the same for you about gay gossip uh, so this is like, you know, if any dead celebrity could come back from world history, who would you have dinner with? Uh, and? I, I, I don't know. And it's just I'm sorry. I don't mean to demean your question. No, no. I, 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 I just am not interested anymore. I am interested in sexuality on a global stage, not just when it, within the microcosm of Hollywood, because, you know, like take Anne Heche. I find that celebrities who 
are either gay or bisexual or something in between make those decisions to flirt between their current choices on how it will look as opposed to how they feel. And there's so many of those in Hollywood mm. that I, I I find it like, you know, Rock Hudson, it's like, it's always the same thing. How is it going to look for the public? Mm -hmm. And even when people who are gay come out, they always do it when it's safe. Yeah. They do it after they've made their careers. Yeah. So that's who you should be asking, Anne. I, I, I wish you would because... <sighs> I don't see a lot of people doing it. Uh, Matt Bomer, uh, I admire very much. Yeah. He did it early on. Um, who else has been kind of gutsy enough to do it earlier on in their careers instead yeah. of later? I mean, there's younger people now, but I think in the way that you were talking about it was chic to be gay in the 90s in some respect, or at least, let's say, bisexual for, you know... Women. Femme presenting yeah. women. Oh, that was only because of Angelina Jolie. Everybody yeah. wanted to be Angelina Jolie. Yeah. Well, I think Drew you know, Barrymore asked, also started that too. It, in it, that I also she was like fluid and like a wild child, like making out with people. Don't agree at all because <laughs> Drew was was compartmentalized to that sort of interesting kind of uh, not a major star mm. and. Angelina Jolie took it to an entirely different level. Yeah. I, I feel like almost like musicians, you know, have been able to come out more. I feel like Drew, who is a lovely woman, I like her very much, was able to, she's more of a boutique star. Mm. She's not a matinee idol. Right. For instance, say if Tom Cruise were gay. Let's just say. And he it. wanted to come sure. out. That's an entirely different conversation than Drew Barrymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that still stands. Yeah, we haven't seen it. It has not existed, and I don't think it's, it's going to exist. I have to tell you, there was a time when I was asking, I think it was when Prop 8 was going on. Mm -hmm. God, that was fucked up, man. Yeah. And I think I was asking stars, you know, if they were gay, who they would marry. And then all the women said Angelina Jolie. It's like, Angelina Jolie, Angelina Jolie. And I asked Meryl Streep that. And she said, Angelina Jolie is the last woman I would sleep with. I thought, I like that. an honest answer. I appreciate her. I appreciate that as well. I still like Brad. I'm team Brad. I think he's an okay guy. You know, he's a Missouri boy, so I've always wanted to stand by him. I'm not sure, but I feel like you know more details than we do. Damien? Yeah. Team Brad or Angelina? Well, I don't know if I'm team. Yeah. I feel like there's been information that has come out about him that makes me have reservations. But he has been one of those people that I have been forgiving, uh, not forgiving of, that I have always just liked yeah. and bought into yeah. his movie stardom. So on a on a base level, I totally agree with you. There was a recent report about his like drinking and like the ways in he was. Oh, there's several. About him being verbally abusive that I was like, well, this isn't great. This is hard to ignore. They're both scuzzy, but I like <laughs> Brad scuzzy. I just think he's more, he's, he's a more charming scuzz bag. I mean, he's just, yeah. It's like choosing lesser evil, sure. you know? Biden, Trump, you know, which one are you gonna choose? Right. I know which one I'm gonna choose, which lesser evil. Yeah. Okay, Bruce, we're gonna wrap up here in a minute. We're gonna give you to your evening back, but we were thinking of of going out on a rapid fire style, and and I, oh, before we do, yeah, yeah, can I mention something? Why I'm so happy to be here because of the strike, correct? Yeah, yes, yeah, and I, I that makes me feel really good because actors and writers have been getting, excuse me, the ninety percentile of actors in Hollywood yeah. and writers have been getting fucked over for decades. And I'm hoping that will change. I mean, Leah Delaria, what, her $20 I paycheck? Know, I know. More power to those women and men and he's, and they's and them's, the whole wonderful, talented majority of Hollywood needs to be treated better. And I th just think it's a great 
reason to be on your wonderful podcast, go Fran Drescher, you know? Yeah. Give them hell. Yeah. Thank you so much for fuck saying the that. Fuckers. Yes, we are union strong. And this is such a pleasure to be having this conversation with you because we know that you are a fan of the industry, even if you left it. We know that you're following suits and its future spinoff. So well, we're rooting for I, a fair deal for all the actors and the writers. Art is my love. Yeah. Good writing, actors, projects that, you know, make you think and inspire and if we keep those people under thumbs in Hollywood, Hollywood thumbs, we're going to be looking at fucking Mamma Mia 10. <laughs> well, I mean. Oh, sorry. We don't agree on that one. <laughs> okay. What's your favorite Abba song? Oh, great question. Oh, I love, I love Chikatita. <laughs> that was the first one. Chik how Chiqui does Chiquitita go? Chiquitita, tell me what's wrong. You're ashamed by your own silence. Oh, ah. oh that's, an, no? that's an interesting choice. Okay, Bruce, what's your favorite <sighs> ABBA? I mean, probably. I, take a chance on me, uh, also perfect. No, 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 no. Knowing me, knowing you. Uh, no. Oh, what's the one, Dancing Fool? Dancing I love Queen? That one. Dancing Queen. <laughs> yeah, the Queen can't remember the correct title for Dancing Queen. I loved yeah, it's a per yeah, that's yeah, a perfect yeah. song. Yes, for sure. And then the one about where she can't, she keeps breaking up with them, but it keeps going back. That's also a favorite. Waterloo. I can't quit you. It's not I can't quit you. Oh, anyway, you want to ask me some <laughs> great question to go out on. I well, can't wait to hear what it is. I don't see. I don't, we'll yeah, see. We're going to see. We're going to temper your, we'll temper your, uh, your vibe on it. But we were thinking that we would go out rapid fire. And help me out here. Like we have a few items. I don't know that they're they're like sort of gossip items. They're like lore at this point that we have just kept alive in conversation with each other. So we thought we would sort of present them to you, and you will. Are these current? No, 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 they're no, old. no, no, no. They're old. No. They're old. They're like so old. Some of them are very old. But sort of just see if you have. So these are like from when I was writing. Some of them are from the 1930s. <laughs> oh, so as I was telling Damien, I, I, this is happening. I thought this would. It's like Miss Havisham in a sequin dress. You're pulling. <laughs> you're pulling her out to get the old gossip shit. Go ahead. Old gossip's fun. Only We're, if you're into it. Only if you're into oh, it. If, if, totally. Oh, and, I mean, and only if you. I mean, I, Tallulah Bankhead was saying she remember when she was asked if some guy was gay, and she said, "Well." You never sucked my dick. <laughs> so and, good. You know, there's, that doesn't there's exist of, anymore. That that sort yeah, of panache does not it, exist. Yeah, no one would say that now. Yeah. And it's like, I wish someone would. Totally. Okay. And do you want to start us off here? Yeah, sure. Okay. So we've long been obsessed with gay Hollywood, like Cesar Romero, who allegedly had a huge dick. And that is like one of many things. Another thing, Jodie Foster dating Gina Shock from the Go-Go's and then Gina apparently dating Sarah Gilbert and breaking up something else. Do you have any little pieces of like gay gossip that you hold on to in your back pocket that you reveal at dinner parties? But we're not at a dinner party. <laughs> All right, Bruce, that's fair. That's fair. But you don't have to tell us if what it is. But do you have dinner? Okay. And if you bought me dinner, a nice dinner, okay, I'd tell you that. Okay. That's... But I mean, we're still getting to know each other, and you want me to put out, and we haven't even had a nice trout almondine or something like that i will trout almondine you all over this town the next time you're in new york i promise <laughs> you but really you don't have to reveal anything but you do have things that you hold tight of course okay beautiful. i love it it's just i love the tease of it but outing i don't even like outing dead people to tell you the truth hmm. to me it smacks of gutlessness oh so you're waiting for them to die before you you know choose to do something they did not there's something despicable about it, I think. Because what they couldn't do while they were alive, we're saying, oh, now, okay. Yeah, I, I feel like, in a way, I feel as a gay man, for me to be outing people who are dead is, uh, it's like the movie that came out. Uh, I think it was disgusting. The guy who pimped servicemen in the 40s and the 50s. Oh, uh, and then he, Scotty, and then he came out. Scotty. Bowers. Yes, yeah, Scotty Bowers that ran the gas station that was for Hustlers. 
Yeah, and he was talking about how much fun these guys were having, earning a little bit on the side. And it's like any man or woman who would say prostitution was a fun ride I have an issue with mm. because a lot of those guys, like many women who choose to participate in prostitution, it's not a happy story. Mm-hmm even though I think it should be legal. Right. The truth is the way that the society treats prostitutes, like they're bad, but the the men and women who are paying them aren't. Right. I I found it immoral, actually. Yeah. This is, I can see Damien looking, would you please get back to something funny? No, 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 not at all. Honestly, I was thinking. That's just his face. That's Damien's thinking face. That's my, okay. I'm well versed in his face. Well, I was also thinking that I never, I wanted to watch that documentary they made about him, but I never did. So I was sort of just taking it all in and your perspective on it is like kind of, is fascinating. Oh, you didn't see it? Mm -mm, No. Yeah. I, I found it very, you know, and he's like a very old man and he's saying, oh, now I can out all these people. And it's, you know, it's not his choice, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, kids and prostitutes get treated horrifically by Hollywood. Yeah. And women. I mean, I used to write constantly about the Oscars. If you play a prostitute, you get an Oscar. Yeah. If you're a straight man and you play gay, you get an Oscar. And the subtext is, oh, if you're brave enough to take on such a tawdry role, Mm, then you should be rewarded. You should be heaped with accolades. And what you're doing is you're demonizing the prostitutes and gay people by only hiring straight men to play them right and, little and women do, but more men little do they know like prostitutes and gay people built the industry so you should be thanking us that's a very good point yeah thank you <laughs> that's something i would have written had i if i was still writing so thank you i wish i could go back in time and say that why don't you all write a column we're thinking about it. We're thinking about <laughs> Are it you? now that you planted the seed. You're, did you hear the silence? You planted a seed in both of our brains. Because you know what you two have that so many people in the business do not? Levity. Oh. It's just missing. People like are reporting about Hollywood like these people are heads of state. Right. And it's like, I'm sorry. I really like Kim Kardashian, Chloe, Chloe is my favorite. But if Kim is going to start making Moo's fashionable, it should not be treated the same as Ukraine fighting for its life. Right. And it is. I agree with you. and But I also think it's some of that like corporation stuff, you know, like I, you know, we have day jobs. Oh, it's all corporate. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, I know what, yeah. as a person who has a day job in digital media, I know what it is like to then be neutered of your persona and anything that allows you to have a personality because it's like, then there's all this legality stuff and it's all of like, yeah. it's like, then it's like, oh, the reasons I got hired are actually like not applicable because you're not interested in any of my panache or, or point of view. You want me to just do a thing that like I have a skill set to do, but with, with none of the flavor, you know? Absolutely, Damien, that is quite true. Okay, so here's here's an item that Ian and I have talked about for years. I don't know if you're going to know anything about it, but this is this is the item. So we have long been obsessed with this story that Jodie Foster, Kelly McGillis were fighting over Whitney Houston at the famed lesbian bar, the Cubby Hole, in the late '80s, early '90s. Have you ever heard of this? What say you? Yes. Okay. Uh, but. You know, you're asking a guy who just said he doesn't like. Oh, we don't want to out anybody. Yes, I know. I mean, I f- unfortunately. Outing people, even if it's people who later came out. Do you know what I mean? And that's another thing that I feel like is dirty pool. Mm. You wait for them to come out and then you tar them with stuff that, that they chose to keep secret at the time. But nice try, Damien. It was impressive. <laughs> well, just, You're welcome to try another one. I just like thinking, like, if me and Anne think, like, if there's smoke, there's... Also, Damien, I'm sorry. I've got to add something here. Yeah. Kelly McGillis has been so misogynistically removed from a great acting career that she had because of how she looks now. Yeah. And I find that despicable. And Whitney Houston had a despicable exit from this planet. And all three women you're talking about are incredibly 
talented and I admire each one of them tremendously. And so for me to then talk about if they were like, I don't know, pussy diving with each other, I, it's just, I don't feel comfortable saying that because it's their business to reveal that. I appreciate you and your integrity. And I, I'm not saying that Anne and I don't have it, but I think in our playful <laughs> but in our but in our own playful well, in our own playful way, in our own attempt to grasp at this, you know, identity in the years. It is just I obviously have of all the respect for Whitney Houston and Kelly McGillis, who we have invited on the show countless times because I'm fascinated by her career and would love to talk to her about her Has she been on? She hasn't been on. But we we, we we hope one day because we were Oh, I hope she does. Yeah, I want her to em- also embrace like, you know, I'm not a lesbian, but my best friend here is and I want her to embrace that community that I think has embraced her in part because again, you know, gay people like Maybe we glom on to our own, you know, when when you when you're yeah. ready. So I want her to come on and talk about that. I hope she does come on. I don't blame her for being, I don't know, hesitant. It sounds like she's being, because look how she's been treated. Yeah, Top Gun Maverick was a fucking disgrace. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. Oh, you know who else it was done to is um, um, Sean Blade Runner. Sh- Who's in, who, oh, Sean Young. Sean Young. Oh, Sean yes. Young. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, Somebody yes. else that we've He's, been chasing for so many years. So good. Also, just like. So, oh, you should get her. She is insane. <laughs> but I love her. Yeah. And that's who you need to get on. And like these monuments, these film monuments yes. that are built to the guy. And the women are treated like, I don't know, just like. They're, they're like their gimmick cameos. Right. And like Sean Young, they didn't even use. They just used old film of her. That was insane. Which I thought was pretty Very awful. low. I mean, maybe if she was dead. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's so out of whack and unfair and misogynistic. Totally. That usually the dicks are controlling the movies. Yep. And, you know, it's the dicks who are doing the casting. They're doing most of the green lighting. And I think that's why this is still happening, that women are che- treated as subpar. Also, like, Kelly McGillis is not a liability on the set of Top Gun. Like, they could have put her in in some capacity. Sean Young is, pr- is probably not a liability. But if anything, she's probably just, like, an eccentric actor which is like is that any different from anyone else on the set of whatever that fucking what was the movie that she was in um blade runner right like that's the one where they, they basically put her cartoon yeah. face on somebody else's body like just like just put her in it again just like have some respect for these women or have some guts yeah instead of doing what everyone else is doing yeah. so stupid so stupid okay bruce we have we have a few left we'll be fast okay have you heard the timmy shimmy story that was unearthed by crazy days and nights about an old-timey actress who fell ill and got a man to masquerade as her in her later years and that man dressed up as a Ah, woman ended ah, up winning the ah, oscar ah, ah, ah. oh my god i guess that would be what olivia pope (laughs) i don't know it is a great story it's a great story it's fast. That's a great story. I cannot, that should be true. I hope it is. I cannot believe that it is, but Anne and I have spent hours researching it. Hours. Really? Yeah. I'm so glad I'm not in that business anymore. <laughs> We're picking up your slack, Bruce. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> that one should lead your column when you start it. Yes, we are. Yeah. Your debut. Right. That's a good one. Who do you think it is? Well, there is there is a scuttlebutt about who it may be. It's people that, you know, we, the, the actress is Alice Brady, who was like a silent film star turned star or of like the, the Oh, talking. I did hear about this. Oh, yes. But, and, it was, and it was Arthur understand. Blake, who was a female impersonator. And apparently Alice Brady's father hired Arthur Blake after he saw what a good mimic he was, a female mimic, because she okay. was so sick and that he hired Arthur Blake to play all of Alice Brady's roles. Oh. And in fact, he was actually on screen in like old Chicago and another movie and then won the Oscar. That makes more sense. I thought you were talking about something contemporary. Oh, my God. <laughs> if only. Which is why I said Olivia Pope. I'm thinking, <laughs> who? Right, who? right. That would be cool if that was contemporary. I'd be into that even more, even. Okay, again, if there's smoke, there's fire. I just want to know what you've heard here. So we found an old story that said that the root of the Kim Cattrall and Sarah Jessica Parker gossip was that 
Sarah Jessica Parker was jealous of Kim's popularity on the show and asked HBO to invest in Cynthia Nixon's Emmy for Your Consideration campaign instead of Kim's, thereby icing out Kim from getting a, a win. Kristen Davis found this out and told Kim Cattrall, and Kim Cattrall like went to the HBO executives, and that's like when this this all started. I guess like the final season of the show. Have you heard this before? Yes, and I don't know if it's true. It wouldn't surprise me because the power on that set was Sarah Jessica, yeah. and I, I, which I don't know. I, I, I really like her, but successful people often do things that are not likable. And if you can't get used to that, then you have no business being a fan. Most of those people have done things that they're probably not very mm. proud of. Yeah. And most importantly, are you watching and just like that? No, I'm not. Because I know that Kim was really hurt by many things. And I don't enjoy... The only reason to watch it, in my opinion, would be to see how they're performing with each other while they can't stand each other. And that's not fun for me anymore. Yeah. If I was still in the business, yeah, of course I would write it. But are you watching it? Um, Is it good? Oh, oh no, it's horrible. No. It's horrible. It doesn't surprise me. It's missing like levity, which she provided on the show. And it feel, it, so it feels like a real loss. And then there's also trying to sort of retcon parts of the show that were like, by building, you know, by building in these new characters that are people of color, making the gay characters more three dimensional, which is all like has good intention behind it, but it's just not the same show. It's sort of like sque squeezed all of the fun out of the original show, and then there's no Kim Cattrall's character, no, no Samantha right. for any of the levity, yeah. for any of the like, you know, brassiness that we all loved about her. It's very hard to go back and be a success, yeah. and I have to say that it also reeked of that a bit to me one reason why i wasn't interested in seeing it yeah i loved the movies because it was taking it to a different level but going back doesn't really interest me totally right the movies like were in a different universe and they were like oh this is a big splashy version of my favorite tv show and right. it's like stupid but fun and popcorn but now it's like right. the this new show is too close to the it's like somewhere in between the original show and the movie and it's like if it's not going to be the original show why bother so that's Any other shows you want to ask me about? <laughs> um, Are you all Ted Lasso fans? Is it for gay people? I'm, this is the first gay person I've heard talk to me about it. Tell me about it. It's definitely for people who feel uh, out of sync with the world, mm. slighted because they're different. And it resonates in a very lovely way for anyone who has ever felt like they weren't part of the club. Okay. And it's all right, hilarious. That's I'm, I'm sold. Oh, Sorry, I'm sold on Ted Lasso, but also, are you watching The Bear? Have you watched The Bear? Tell me about The Bear. I highly recommend The Bear. It's about a restaurant. Why? It's about a restaurant. It's just like the most intimate, tiny, like the way it's filmed is like very intimate and tiny. It's a dramedy. Yeah. The acting is exquisite. It's just like really fun storytelling that is both like heartbreaking, but also there's a lot of levity to it. So I highly recommend. I think it's, it's not for, if you are a person who... Like, it takes place in a restaurant, so there's a lot of, like, you feel the, the sense of urgency as you would if you were working back at the house at a busy restaurant. But yeah. it's, it is exquisitely acted and written, so I highly recommend. And I'm still pacing myself through the second season because I don't want it to end. I've had a lot of noir tastes, I think, in TV lately. Mm. And I just live for shows like uh, The Fall, yes. Gillian Anderson, Loved. Killing Eve. And I, I'm finding myself getting more into a very female-driven mm. television that's smart. Well, I love that. Have you watched Glow on Netflix? No, I haven't. Was it good? I yes. was a huge fan of it. I think every season it got better. And it, it's, it's, it is a comedy, but also has pathos and is very well acted. And I, Betty Gilpin is a total superstar. And... It's like a really fun, goofy show with a lot of it's smart and well acted and well written about strong, smart women. Have you seen Hacks? Yes, yes loved. of course. I thought season you two was outrageous. I thought it was outrageously good. It's outrageously good. She's so owning being an older woman still hanging in. Yeah, I love yes. her so much. And I'm so glad Jean Smart is getting all her flowers. Agree. Me too. 
Aren't flowers lovely? The best. And I just love flowers. I particularly love roses. Okay. This is good to know for when I get you that trout almondine, I'll show up with roses. <laughs> Yellow. Yeah. That, those are for friendship. Yes. <laughs> and they're just gorgeous. You know I'm giving you shit. Nope. Please. But I do love roses. We're here to receive the <laughs> shit, Bruce. This is why we're here. I can't even tell you that this has been peak entertainment conversation for Damien and I. This really is decades in the making. So Bruce, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's been a real honor. Here's the thing. Every once in a while, this show provides Damien and I the opportunity to dip our toes back into our former selves and sort of revisit that self as an adult. Mm. And it's part of what we love about our friendship and part of what we love about this show and what it allows us to do. But Bruce Bibby really allowed us to do that in such a deep way because Damien and I loved his work so much and like the amount of hours you and I spent on message boards and on the awful truth the blog awful trying truth. to figure I, out so I love the way you used to say it it had like he used to like like smile through it like the awful truth I used to like do an impression of it as a kid uh, I didn't tell yeah. him this because I didn't want to turn it you know I didn't want to like make him be like we don't want to scare eyes. him away yeah yeah and I feel like we, I feel like hopefully we were properly reverential because I feel like we really did love his work but it is also interesting to think about like the ethical boundaries of gossip and what that means and what it means for us as kids who are grasping at gayness and anything and now as like adults who are still interested but want to be respectful but also like you know the Scotty Bowers conversation was so interesting because like I loved that documentary and thought it was so fascinating but also totally hear what Bruce was saying that there is something sort of grotesque about drawing out all of this after someone's dead and being like well now that they're all dead we can you know say this piece but it really I thought it the conversation went in so many unknown places that was so exciting to me including I really hope we got Bruce to revisit Mamma Mia and finally watch Mamma Mia 2. I just want a voice memo to show up mysteriously on our phone with that review because I feel like we pushed hard for it and I stand by it and I I really I feel like we could have talked for hours and hours and hours about a variety of things and I hope that someday I get to take him out for Trout Almondine and get all the dirty secrets. <laughs> I can't wait. Bruce, please let us know next time you're in New York. We did tell you we, we would binge watch suits before we ever meet you in person and we will That's do it. right we will do it babe we want to take you out for that trout almondine and get all the goods i will say also you know i think that bruce was like oh this like got all these gossip items that you guys are interested in are like so old and like does anyone even know about them and i was like <laughs> we actually need to talk about like Kim Cattrall and SJP. We actually like need yeah. to talk about Kelly McGillis and Whitney Houston and Jodie Foster because these are gossip items that have like been on the podcast already. Our listeners yeah. care about this. They care about Timmy Shimmy. They care about Kim Cattrall not getting the FYC money from HBO. They care about Whitney Houston being... I cannot imagine Whitney Houston like being between Kelly McGillis and Jodie Foster. It's so shocking I know. I so know. I, could, we, I was okay. First of all, I just I, I, this is a sidebar, but I was just reading up on Ray J and Whitney Houston, and I was like, oh my god, I forgot that Ray J and Whitney Houston had a thing. And I was like, I think that Whitney Houston was just so effervescent and so charismatic and so sexual that like it just it, it it crossed all boundaries at all times. Everybody, I think, would fucking have fallen for Whitney Houston. Remember Lori Petty told us about being in a pool oh and yeah whitney shit houston. go listen to and that she was with karen parsons like oh yeah go listen to the Lori petty episode there's a great whitney houston story in it i you know the secrets that bruce bibby holds the I, secrets uh, that bruce bibby holds also whew. speaking of episodes of ours that you could listen to and something that i was like when i was listening back to the episode with bruce he talked about anne heche and her like sort of straddling the line of like identity mm. and i think we yeah. actually had a really interesting and fairly self-actualized conversation to some extent with Anne before she passed about her coming out and like also yeah. her own looking back on that and, and it's like self-reflection about it and also the way the media treated it you know I just I think it made if that interested you or if that if your ears peak up uh, like what is it if your ears perked up at all up. during that part yeah. I recommend going back and listening to that at least the part where she talks about the coming out experience I thought it was interesting same and I feel like you know 
if this podcast did one thing, hopefully it, it made sure everybody listening knows who Cindy Adams is. And to me, that is a mitzvah. <laughs> and Liz Smith. And Liz Smith. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Liz Smith is the better of the two, let's be honest. She was a lesbian, at least. So Who's the that. redhead? Is that best, Liz Smith? That's Cindy Adams. Cindy Adams was best friends with Roy Cohn. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, I do this every... I like. But so was their... Barbara Walters. So it's, you know, like, I feel like... May she, re- we, may she rock. May she rest. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Don't give me a one-star review. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, Damien said it. It's time to leave us a review. If you have <laughs> left us a review, get somebody else to leave us a five-star review and write some kind words or just leave a shrimp emoji. You know that's calling it back to year one. Bring <laughs> us the reviews if you know what's good for you. It's the thing that helps us stay at the top of the algorithm and get in other people's eyes and ears. We would be so appreciative if you took the time to do it eh, wherever you listen, but Apple Podcast app would be great. Thanks so much. And while you're on your phone, follow us on social media. You can follow me at Damian Bellino on all of the things. It's Damian with an A, not like Damian with an E. Damian Bellino, <laughs> and you can find my best friend, Rodeme. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I have the giggles. And you can find my best friend, Anne, here at Rodeman, and that's R O D E M A N N E. And you can follow, you might know her from on Instagram and TikTok, where you're posting show footage there. We're posting photos and videos of past guests, future guests, people that are dead that we love. So check us out at you might know her from on TikTok and Instagram. And if you didn't know already, You Might Know Her From is produced by us independently. Damien Bellino, Ann Rodeman. This is us putting our money forward for the project that we love that's bringing you actress interviews. And in the meantime, interviews with world-famous gossip columnists until SAG after ends its strike. So you're listening to an independently produced podcast. Good for you. We want to thank our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. That is, of course, Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. All the editing that you hear on each and every episode Mm, of mm, You Might mm, Know Her mm, From mm, is mm. courtesy of Daniel Sears. He saves our life and our livelihood and keeps us out of the papers daily. He's going to edit that a whole part hour and couldn't find me on the tab on her computer. And it was about (laughs) eight minutes of her looking for me. I'm 40. Give me a break. We want to thank Gang, all of that music you hear underscoring each and every episode of You Might Know Her From, especially ones like this special episode. That's by Gang. You can download and stream Gang wherever you listen to your music. And if you're not sure who's the redhead and who's the blonde lesbian, guess what? You're going to find <laughs> out in the show notes when you click on that picture of Cindy Adams and Liz Smith. I document each and everything we discuss on this show in the show notes so we have an easily referenceable point of reference an easily referenceable point of reference my brain (laughs) is fried but that's what i do for you folks i put it in the show notes it's important for us it's important for you i love the way liz smith looks i just looking at her same do you remember damien okay when we interviewed Donna Murphy, who I love, and I just saw the promo poster for Gilded Age Featured, Season 2, babe. which drops, she's she got... is dead center, hovering <laughs> above her, above all of them, and luckily that gummer is pushed to the side. Hopefully she'll get <laughs> shadowed out soon enough. Donna Murphy but, is Jenna Lyons in Houses of New York. She is right is dead yeah. in the center. Good for her. That's so true. She's so good in it. I love her so much, but when we interviewed her, we had a whole bit about how when Wonderful Town performed at the Tonys, they had this cool cold open that happened like outside at a cafe and Liz Smith was in the cafe like at the cafe table and had like a little bit before the Tony number started and we had this whole question in the rapid fire but we spent a lot of time with Donna and we had a lot of (laughs) questions and so we didn't get to it we had to cut it but these are the things that get left on the cutting room floor and I really wish we had the answer Donna if you're listening honestly we're gonna clip this we're gonna put it on Instagram and we're gonna tie Donna (laughs) She's yeah, and Do- guess what? Donna Murphy is one of the most generous people on social media, so I have high hopes that she'll respond. We love you, Donna. Period. Mrs. Astor, we love you. Emmy nom, babe. <laughs>